Acts 10, 1 through 17. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon at about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? He answered, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for, certain, for a certain Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. Um, about noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven open and something like a large sheet come down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. Now, while Peter was greatly puzzled about what to make of the vision he had seen, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared. Good morning, friends. It's good to be with you. If I haven't met you yet, I'm Pastor Dan, um, and I can remember this moment like it was yesterday. Uh, we were sitting in our minivan, full car, uh, me and my wife, three kids, had an aunt and uncle in the car with us too, and we had stopped at the stop sign in some small town, rural Ohio. And then without knowing, all of a sudden there was this bam, and whew, we jarred forward, some guy had just come and rear-ended us from behind. And before you knew it, you ever, have you had those moments where you're just kind of thrown forward? This force strikes you in such a way that you're jarred into a new position. Have you anyone been there, like, been there before? It was scary. You didn't know what was going to happen. And, and there was this disorientation. Like, after it hits you, you're like, did, did that really happen? And then you start asking, everyone okay? Do we need to call the paramedics? And before, you know, we could get out of our disorientation, this car, pull, all of a sudden, the car that hit us took off and started speeding down the road and all around the corner. And I'm watching that happen, and all of a sudden, another car pulls up, actually, it was a big truck, pulls up next to us, and they say, do you want me to go chase them? <laughs> it's a small town, rural Ohio. I'm like, yeah, yeah. And so he starts chasing after him, and, you know, in this disorientation, I get out, and I go around the back, and poor guy who hit us. Not only did we find out he not have insurance, but when he hit us, his front license plate fell off. So <laughs> it's going to be pretty clear to find this guy. But if you've had a moment like whiplash like that, you, no matter what happens, even though we are all safe, um, you move forward in a different direction, right? I mean, even your timidity when you approach that intersection next time, something's changed in you. I mean, it might even be physical. It might be mental. The van was certainly not in the best shape after that. You had these moments where you're moving in a direction, something happens, there's this disorientation, and then you decide to move forward. In our passage today, Acts chapter 9 and 10, there are these moments where, like an equation, if you will, you're moving in one particular direction, and then all of a sudden there's an encounter. And it's so whiplashy that there's this disorientation, but because of that, you realize at the end of it, you're going to move forward in a completely different direction. There's at least three of these moments in our text. For me, I remember one for uh, 18 years, I made, of, I made fun of someone in my household because uh, she liked peanut butter and banana. Yeah, and I, I, I'm fine with either separate you know, I'm like, strawberries and chocolate, don't mix them for me. You know, just give me one or the other. But peanut butters and banana. I, I judged this particular person for 18 years. And then a couple months ago, I went downtown to a coffee shop, and I ordered, like, a toast and a coffee. And I didn't really know what I was ordering with the toast, but out it came, and it had peanut butter and honey and bananas. And I realized I'm too cheap to not eat it. 
And so I'm going to try this thing. And I ate it. And the worst part was it was good. <laughs> and so I would have to admit this to my lovely wife when I went home. Right? Have you, have you had moments where all of a sudden something happens and then you're forever changed? Junior hires who are going on the missions trip. You might encounter some things this week that are disorienting. And you may not have intended to change, but you're going to come back in a new direction. You're going to see some things differently when you come home. The first passage, if you got your Bibles, go to Acts chapter 9 or pull it open on an app on your phone, that's fine, is Saul. The two chapters that we read this week, it begins with the story of Saul. It's a remarkable story because Saul was moving in one direction. Chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, it says, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest. He asked him for letters to the synagogues so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, this is this movement of Jesus, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Can you see his trajectory? A terror of the early church. That's what Saul was. He stood by and watched the first Christian martyr be killed, giving permission for it to happen. This is Saul. This is his trajectory. And then all of a sudden, verse 3, he's struck by God. It says, as, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground. He heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It goes on, and that voice says, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Friends, God crashed into him. He moved close to him in love. Do you know that God can show up even when we are on a path of destruction? This is where Saul's going. He's going to breathe more murderous threats against church folk. And on that path of destruction, Jesus gets in his way. And there's this disorientation. His was literal, verses 8 and 9. Saul gets up from the ground, but when he opens his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind. He did not eat or drink anything. And then after this moment, so just like last week with Philip, Saul's having this moment over here, but God's stirring the pot over here with a, a, a guy named Ananias who was told by God to go and talk to and lay your hands on this guy named Saul. And if I'm Ananias, I'm thinking, oh, I would love to lay my hands on this persecutor of Christians. But that's not what God had in mind. He said, go. And in the verse, verse, uh, seven, or verse 17, it says, Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? Friends, you see the equation play out. He's moving in this direction. God gets his attention. There's this disorientation. And then Saul chooses to walk in a new direction, so new, he's now preaching the name of the one he was condemning. His disciples were a little leery about this. I think rightly so. Here comes this guy that has been trying to take your life, and he's now saying, I want to speak for the one you worship. But they finally came around and saw the terrorist of Christians became an evangelist for Jesus. Friends, you can spend the whole of your life building a reputation of hardness against God, but it just takes one encounter with God to change everything. So friends, we, people of faith, we don't give up on anybody. And some of you are thinking of kids or maybe grandkids or loved ones. You're like, if only they would stop on their path of destruction. We are people of faith. We believe if he can do it with Saul, I've seen you move. You move the mountains. 
and I believe I'm going to see you do it again, right? We believe that God can change anybody. The terrorist turned. He was freed from a lifetime of misplaced loyalty. He thought what his lifestyle was right and good. He was following the rules with intensity and passion. But once he encountered Jesus, he realized it was just a misplaced passion. And he was freed for godly purpose. Freed for godly purpose. So I'm here to pronounce to you today, if you didn't know this already, the trajectory of your life that you came in with today doesn't have to be your trajectory when you leave this place. Right? The trajectory of your past does not necessarily, because of Jesus, mean that has to be your trajectory for the future. Because when you encounter Jesus, everything will change. And that's just one story, Saul. And then we have Peter, and I'm going to do these together because they're tied together and it's going to I got one more week to mess with you back there, Anna, so I'm going to take advantage of it. Peter, his story is he was moving in a particular direction, a little bit different than Saul. He was doing such incredible healing and ministry. There was this woman named Tabitha, also called Dorcas, great name, right? Who died. They called Peter. He goes to Tabitha, and he lays his hands on her, and she is raised from the dead. I'm thinking the trajectory of his life is just fine. Acts chapter 10, verse 9. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to play, pray, eh, maybe play, and then he was struck by God. God moved close to him. Verse 10. He became hungry. He wanted something to eat, and while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven opened and something like a large sheet coming down being lowered to the ground by its four corners. Inside the sheet were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Now, first of all, notice the sheet's trajectory was coming from heaven down. Okay? This thing was coming from a holy place to a common place. And on this sheet, this image he has, there are kosher and non-kosher foods coming down from heaven. So if you know anything about Jewish law, they strictly forbid certain kinds of food that you could and could not eat. Those things were mixed together on this sheet. And so the angel in this vision tells Peter, get up, kill, and eat. And he's like, "Uh uh-uh. This is disorienting, right? God appears, and all of a sudden his mind's blown. Peter says in verse 14, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that's profane or unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, What God has made clean you must not call profane. This happens three times, and the thing was suddenly taken back up to heaven. God tells Peter, What I have made clean you must not call common or unclean. So friends, remember in the in the very beginning of the book there were things in the Old Testament that told them there are certain things that are holy and certain things that are common. There's a story about the Good Samaritan. Have you heard that story before? There were priests and religious leaders who did not help the man who was bleeding. One of the reasons might not just be because they had a hard heart, but they were holy and if they touched someone who had an illness or bleeding, they would be defiled. That's how they thought. The holy would become common if touching something common. So all of a sudden, they're both on the sheet together, and God's saying, don't call unholy what I call holy. Don't call common what I call uncommon. It happens three times, three times. Peter still thinks he's talking about food at this point. But remember, three times is the number of times Peter denied Jesus. And three times is the number of times Jesus reinstated Peter on the beach. Peter's a little hard-headed. But he starts to finally get it. He, he welcomes. So at the same time, Cornelius is having this moment that Kenzie read for us where he's told to go and get this guy named Peter. He doesn't know why, but send for him. Cornelius is not a Jewish man. 
and he sends non-Jewish men to Peter. Peter lets them in the house. And then after the night, he goes with these men back to Cornelius' home. I'll tell you more about this in a second, but Peter in verse 34, while he's there, he begins to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Notice, Peter's mind was changed before he preached and they had an encounter with God. He was welcomed into the home of a non-Jew. This was taboo. This is much deeper than Michigan and Ohio State hatred, okay? There's, there's one story that this was so taboo that uh, if a Jew married a Gentile, the Jewish community had the right and would often have a funeral for the Jew and consider them dead. The Gentiles, they thought that the Jews were weird traditionalists who believed they were evil plotters who worshipped pigs. Why else wouldn't they eat bacon? I think they have a good argument, right? They don't like each other, and all of a sudden, they, Peter is welcomed into this home. His closed mindedness needed to change. And I think Pastor Grace is going to talk about this in the future weeks. That the chapter 15 on, this begins to take new form. But what essentially God is doing here is saying your cultural identity does not have to define if you can or cannot come to Jesus. Or more specifically, non Jewish people are acceptable or welcome to come to Christ on the same basis as the Jews. Imagine your whole life being raised and taught the opposite, though. Peter's conversion wasn't Saul's, but it was just as significant. He had to convert his mind. And friends, there's that verse in there, Acts 10, 34. It says, I realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. Friends, this, this is awesome because God is an equal opportunity includer. An equal opportunity includer. I think of it like this. What he's saying is if you and I were going to run a race together and you were Jewish and I wasn't, you could just run if you wanted to follow Jesus. You could just say, I want to follow Jesus, and you could just start running on that path. I, if I'm a non-Jew, would have some obstacles. There were 613 Jewish laws that I would be expected to follow, and I'd have to be circumcised. Just a few hurdles, right? To try to go on the same path, and Jesus is saying, no, 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 all, all can start at the same place if you want to be part of this new family that I'm creating. God does not show favoritism, but the verse doesn't end there. This is not, I want to say this clearly, this is not God saying, I am tolerant of all. Find your own way to heaven. It's fine. That's not what he's saying here. Keep reading the next part of the verse is often left off in our memes, right? God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him, does what is right, that, uh, that has some encounter with the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. God's not just an equal opportunity includer. The cross of Jesus is an equal opportunity offender. If I want, we sang the song, I believe you are the way. What? Right? But that's what he's saying. He's saying all can, and Cornelius, and Peter, and Saul can all start at the very same place, but it goes through the cross. He says you need to fear him, verse 42, because he's going to judge us all someday. It goes on and says, if you do what is right, which that means is you don't have to work this out yourself, but your actions should match your belief according to the word of God. And third, he says, this good news of peace through Jesus Christ. What that means in, in Luke, whenever he writes, when he talks about peace, remember he called Jesus the Prince of Peace, he's talking about salvation in Jesus Christ. I may need to do some conversion in my brain of what I think it means to follow Jesus 
Peter was pretty clear in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Chloe mentioned already, this repentance is turning in a different direction. Can you imagine Saul after he was blinded and then touched by God saying, that was well and good, but I got a good thing going over here. And I'm going to go back to the life I want to live. No, repentance is, is admitting that the way you're walking is wrong and walking in a different direction. And though he says you will receive forgiveness for your sins. Again, equal opportunity includer. We all have this permission to start over because his love compels him to intersect with us. He's not doing it because he, he's just this judge and he's this harsh critic of our lives. God so loves us that he sent his son to intersect with all of us that we could, through repentance, through faith in Jesus, run whoo, the life he's called us to live. And one day, like the text says, he will be Lord of all. Lord means leader. Leader of my mind, of my pocketbook, of my sex life, of the way I read scripture, all of it. Lord of all, all people of all things. Peter needed to be freed from his faulty thinking and freed for the mind of Christ. I'll just jump down to the end. Um, for Peter and Cornelius, there was more internal things that needed to change. But it said, while Peter was speaking to Cornelius, I love this, this is every preacher's dream. I'll just tell you. It said, while he was preaching, the Spirit of God fell upon the listeners. And Peter's like, whoa! Right? Because the sign, the presence of God had now said to these unworthy vessels, you're worthy of my presence. Right? It's saying to the ones that they said they had, they, the gospel's not for them, Jesus ain't for them, God suddenly shows up and the sign of his presence is his Holy Spirit coming among them. And so the people are like, what do we do with this? It's a whiplash moment. Peter becomes a defender of the Gentiles. And you and I, most of us here, didn't grow up Jewish, are here because of this whiplash moment. Friends, I don't know what you walked in here with today. But as we were worshiping, I realized I needed to, to let God convert me a little bit in my thinking. Some of you, maybe your conversion is from sin to freedom. Maybe you came in here with one trajectory and you encountered God somehow. And he's disorienting you a little bit. Turn toward his love. Turn toward his love. It's his love that is sending Jesus into your life. It's his love that has compelled you here today. In just a second, we're going to take communion. We remember that his love sent his son to die for each of us and through the spilling of his blood be made whole once again. He did it because he loves you. Would you be converted from your sin to freedom? Or maybe it's from one way of thinking to the mind of Christ. For some, it's from apathy to purpose. Or for some, maybe your conversion today is I've been trying to do this all by myself and I can't do it anymore. When you come today, all are invited to come and receive his bread, his cup. There's some kneeling rails down front. Would you just take a moment with the one who loves you so? Let him be your Lord. Let him be your leader. Would you fall in love with him? Let us pray. God, as we take these elements may they be something so much more more than just bread more than just juice may they be a symbol of just how, how far you will go to make sure our future is one of hope and not despair that our future is one of freedom and not sin that our future is one of life abundant. God, set us free today. Set us free today. 
In the name of Jesus, I pray.